their endless effort to hunt for survivors. We're just doing the best we can, trying to dig through all the rubble. Um, you know, we're, we're not totally fatigued yet, but you can see if this is going to go on for a while, uh, it's going to start to wear. You know, uh, the guys have been working, uh, um, you know, virtually uh, not 24 hours a day, but pretty close to it. You know, um, you know they're going to start feeling the effects of that, I guess, soon. Now to keep this thing continuing, that each crew goes in there and they work. They work a lot. They work very, very hard, but they work only for a few hours at a time. And they're using that old-fashioned uh, bucket brigade that we told you about last night. And uh, it's continuing as we speak. Now, more on the rescue is my colleague right here, Kimberly Richardson, who's joining me now, and she has a lot to tell you about. Hi, Mike. We've been standing here all night. We've been watching these rescue crews flow to and from that crash site. It's excruciating work, both on their minds and on their bodies. The work is emotionally and mentally draining. Crews at Ground Zero say physically the rescue effort also takes its toll. If you can imagine putting 65, 75 pounds on and doing it, I mean, because that's what this gear weighs, about 75 pounds after you fully suit it up, and then having to try to crawl and climb and step down, up, down, over, it's just... It's, uh, it'll, it'll work really wear you out. Firefighters are up against twisted metal, sharp glass, hot spots. A strenuous job that with every move can mean the difference between life and death. Bill Doris and his partner just arrived in Lower Manhattan from Toronto. After watching the scenes unfold on television, they say they had no choice but to come. Every single piece of rock and stuff has to be picked up one piece at a time. And the more people there, we can help, we can help anyway, whatever we can do. If they've got the will to live, you know, we got the will to get them out. I think that kind of sums up everybody's feelings out there. There was one bit of good news this afternoon. Late this afternoon, the USNS Comfort pulled in. It's initially the 894-foot Navy vessel was going to be used as a floating morgue. It's not going to be used for that anymore. It's where these rescuers will be living. It will be home for them for as long as it takes. Back to you, Linda and Harry. Okay, thank you very much, Kimberly. This story is of such huge proportions that other members of our Fox family from around the country have come to New York City to cover it and to help us cover it and to help bring the information to you. But one of the elements that we're going to be talking about, one of the aspects of the stories over the next couple of days is going to be identifying uh, the bodies, identifying the remains of loved ones uh, who are found in the rubble. And one of the ways that they are going to do that is to use DNA samples. It's a very difficult process. Here's Monica Morales with more. That's right. It's a real grim reality for these families, but they're facing it tonight. Now, DNA is on almost anything, your clothing, your toothbrush, and it looks like this, and it takes about half a day to process. So you can imagine the amount of time it's going to take for some closure for these families. He has five kids. I mean, he has five kids. Of course he has five kids because probably he's waiting there for the guys to rescue him. Robert Mullock holds on to hope that his best friend will come out of the rubble. Hector Rodriguez, a New York firefighter, last seen in the lobby of the World Trade Center, helping people get to safety. When he became a firefighter, he said that he just got the best job in the world. One sample is a lot of work. Leslie Johnson is a forensic scientist. She says DNA could be the key to giving Robert, along with thousands of others, a definitive answer as to what happened. A machine like this one is at ground zero tonight, processing the hundreds of personal items brought in by grieving families. You've got blood, you've got saliva, you've got uh, skin cells, say an electric razor, uh, a hairbrush, be full of hairs, a uh, jogging suit. And if you don't have that... I ask you to open your mouth nice and wide. That's it. And I'm just rubbing inside the mouth. Johnson shows me how easy it is to give your own DNA to help find a loved one. There we're going to have to go back and reconstruct families. And it's, it's very doable. It's just a matter of, of looking at the genetics. For Robert, answers can't come too soon. And I hope he's going to come out. And there is a national database with all of these profiles. Take a look at this one. This is a mother and a son. Now, this machine will be working about 23 hours a day, and it continues its work tonight. Monica Morales, Fox 5 News.
All right, Monica, thank you very much. Uh, up the street uh, where there was a lot of activity last night, uh, it is a lot quieter, but they are doing the painstaking work of putting the phones line, phone lines back together, splicing them together wire mm -hmm. by wire by wire. It's a very arduous task, as you can imagine. Also, they're in the process of restoring power to a lot of the buildings down here. Our very own Penny Crone has been covering that story today. We're going to have that story coming up for you in just a little bit. Also, we are going to be having some pictures from inside the World Trade Center, pictures that you have not seen before. That's coming up a little bit later on. But for now, John and Rosanna, we're going to toss it back to you guys. All right. Thank you very much, Linda Harry. And on this day of remembrance, we now know the names of the hijackers who carried out those despicable crimes. We're going to show you the names. Maybe you knew one of them. You might want to take a close look, and if so, call the FBI. The men aboard the flight out of Boston to hit the North Tower of the Trade Center. And the plane to hit the South Tower a few minutes later. And the terrorists who took over Flight 93 from Newark, and then were overpowered by the passengers. And the plane from Dallas that hit the Pentagon. As we told you at the start of our newscast on this day of remembrance, the feds made their first arrest in the terror attacks. And the FBI is also scouring records of flight schools and searching houses the suspects rented. Now grab a pen because maybe you can help. Bob O'Brien has more on what the feds have to go on right now. Bob. And, Rosanna, this is what we know right now. Federal authorities have the first arrested suspect in this case here in New York. That suspect is believed to have information relevant to the investigation. There are no other details on the arrest, but we do know what else the FBI wants to examine. Federal agents are looking hardest at the flight training terror pilots like 33-year-old Mohammed Atta got in South Florida flight schools. Ada was one of two Arab men who were trained in a flight simulator at the Sim Center Flight School in Opelaka, south of Miami. This individual did not want a full course. They just wanted to become familiar with a jet aircraft. One program the simulator used was of the Washington, D.C. area. And I'm approaching uh, rotate speed, which is like the equivalent, I guess, of lifting off. And we're airborne. And, and there's the Pentagon. There's the Pentagon, and we would be... I have the power back and that's the horn, but that would be, you're, we're diving towards the Pentagon. The FBI believes Otto was at the controls of the plane that hit the North World Trade Center tower and that his companion, Marwan al Shehi commandeered the jetliner that crashed into the other 110-story tower. FBI Director Robert Mueller clearly wishes his agents had kept keener eyes on who was being trained to fly airliners and why. The fact that there were a uh, number of individuals that happened to receive training at flight schools here uh, is news, quite obviously. If we had understood that to be the case, uh, uh, we would have, uh, perhaps one could have averted this. William Daly, for 10 years an FBI foreign counterintelligence agent, says the terrorists blindsided the FBI and America. An airliner is an obvious uh, weapon of choice for mass terror. Well, I, I would think that uh, for people going for this sophisticated training, there should have been some credentialing, some checking, maybe with the Federal Aviation Administration or some other authority to be able to say, should these people you know, be trained? What is their ultimate intent? Even with 4,000 FBI agents assigned to the investigation they have dubbed Operation Pent Bomb, you may be able to help. Get a pencil. There is a number you can call for the FBI hotline. The number is 816 Four eight three five one three seven. If you can help, please do. John. All right, thanks, Bob. And on this National Day of Remembrance, New Yorkers crowded into places of worship, while others are still heading to the hospitals to try to find information about their loved ones. Bob DeCastro is on the east side with more for you right now. Bob? John, this wall of prayers that we've been standing by all day long started off a few days ago as just one picture. Now there are hundreds. This has turned into a huge memorial at Bellevue Hospital. Just a few hours ago, there was a candlelight vigil here held for the victims, for those people that might be trapped in the rubble. But I tell you what, there was a huge outpouring of support all across the city. Take a look. At St. Patrick's Cathedral, people gathered to say their prayers for those who might be lost in the rubble. A special mass was held there in their honor. Now, one by one, candles were gently placed near the altar, each of them representing one of the missing. On the Upper West Side in Lincoln Center, the cultural center of the city was the site of a huge candlelight vigil there. Hundreds gathered to pray and show their support in the plaza. 
and people p packed the streets of the West Village. Hundreds came to the heart of that neighborhood. They sung patriotic songs like God Bless America. They said several prayers, and in the end, doves were let go, doves the symbols of peace. Now back here, back here live at the Wall of Prayers, these candles, they continue to burn, and people continue to come here to take a look at all the pictures on the walls. For many people, the candles that continue to burn, they are symbols of hope. They still have hope that people are still alive. They believe that their loved ones can still and will be found. We're live at Bellevue Hospital. Bob DeCastro, Fox 5 News. John Rosanna, back to you. Okay, thank you, Bob. You know, there's great sadness at a firehouse on the west side, Engine Company 54 at 48th Street and 8th Avenue. It's affectionately known as Broadway's firehouse because it protects the theater district. This one firehouse lost 15 firefighters in the disaster. That's nearly half its company. Most rushed to help after the second airplane hit the Trade Center. They never came out. People are stopping by, total strangers leaving flowers and lighting candles. Pictures of the missing men are posted in the firehouse windows. President Bush and other political leaders took part in a Day of Remembrance prayer service in Washington. He was joined by former Presidents Ford, Carter, Bush, and Clinton, as well as religious leaders like Reverend Billy Graham and Cardinal McCarrick. It was held at the National Cathedral. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Let us also pray for divine wisdom as our leaders consider the necessary actions for national security. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We see the evil of destruction and the suffering of the many of our people before our eyes. With broken and humble hearts and with tears in our eyes, we turn to you, our Lord. No matter how hard we try, words simply cannot express the horror, the shock, and the revulsion we all feel over what took place in this nation on Tuesday morning. May he bless the souls of the departed. May he comfort our own. And may he always guide our country. God bless America. All right, I just want to give you that FBI number again, just double-checking ourselves. It's 866-483-5137. That's the FBI hotline. Now, I know we've been giving you a lot of numbers, but we want to make sure they're all accurate. And we've been asking you to email us pictures of missing loved ones. We've gotten hundreds and hundreds of uh, pictures. Patricia Wu has been going through them, and she's in our newsroom right now. Patricia? Here we are. That's right, John. The pictures continue to pour in. Yahoo has been helping us expand our website as those pictures continue to come in. We've been trying to call each and every family member that has sent us pictures, and now you can do something to help as well. You can look closely at these pictures that I'm going to show you, and if you have any information, you can call. Now, this is Christina Donovan Flannery. This is her wedding picture, as you can see. She was just married in June. 
Now, I spoke to her sister-in-law earlier tonight, and she said she is absolutely the nicest person she has ever met, that she was always looking for a way to help others. So please, if you can help Christina's family now, if you have any information, especially if you're a rescue worker, a doctor, a nurse, you can call 718-497-8049. This is Mark Brisman. I talked to his wife a little bit ago. They've been married for eight years. Their anniversary is coming up. They have a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. Now, she, Juliet told me that she's been telling her, their kids that Daddy's away, but today she said she felt that she needed to tell them that Daddy is in heaven with God. And her four-year-old daughter asked her, can God make Daddy again through her tears? Now, while she has accepted this she says she still wants mark's picture up because in case anyone has any information anything at all because she has so many questions if they can provide even one answer she would be so appreciative so if you have that information please call 914-273-7094 this is linda lee linda lee's family and friends desperately miss her if you have any information about Linda, you can call us here at Fox 5, and that number is 1-877-TELL-FOX-5. If you've seen Linda, her family and friends miss her smile and her eyes. They say that she always had a twinkle in her eyes. Now, this is Evan, Evan Gillette. I spoke to his fiance earlier tonight. She said that she did talk to Evan shortly after the first plane hit, and he said, I've got to go. Now, she's talked to some of his coworkers that did, did manage to get out, and they've told her that after the first plane hit, they were told they could either leave or stay. They were in the other building, and they felt that that building was secure, that that first plane was just an accident. At that point, they didn't realize that it was an attack. So if you have any information for Evan's fiance, please call her at 212 423-0777. Herman Sandler is the CEO and founder of Sandler O'Neill. So we have been trying to reach his daughter Jordana on her cell phone. She, uh, we've been trading a few voicemails. She's very, very anxious. She says that he and 66 other of his employees are still missing. So please, if you've got any information, please call Herman's family at 917-921-0129. Now, as you can see on the right side of your screen, those rescue workers are still hard at work. They have been at it for so many days, and they're not giving up. So we don't want you to give up, okay? Look closely at Dennis's picture. This is Dennis Maroney, and his family and friends have set up a hotline. That hotline number is 212-930-4412. So if you have any information, please call that number on the screen. Deepika Satalori. Now, we have spoke with um, her, Deepika's sister, and she said that Deepika worked for Marsh on the 97th floor, and no one has heard anything from her since Tuesday. Her brother and her husband have been tirelessly making the rounds of area hospitals looking for any information. So if you have that information, please call her family at 847-359-8109. Lisa King Johnson is 35 years old. We spoke to her sister who told us she works on the 89th floor of the second tower. Now, she spoke to her husband after the first plane hit, and she said she was going down. She was seen leaving with a coworker named Lauren. Now, her family has found out that Lauren, through other coworkers, was treated and released from NYU. So, Lauren, if you're watching, or anyone who knows Lauren, they don't have a last name right now, please call Lisa's family. That number, 718-863-7579. And we will continue to bring you these pictures. So thank you very much for looking at these pictures. These families are so grateful. Back to you, John and Rosanna. Okay, thanks, Patricia. Well, you know, there were people from all walks of life struck down in this cruel act of terror. We talked with two survivors at the hospital, a firefighter and a woman who worked in the World Trade Center. 
do you know what happened to you now? Uh, did, did, were you hit by falling debris, chunks of uh, concrete and metal? And yeah, that? yes, I would say so. Mm -hmm. The injury I sustained in my arm, mm -hmm. so you can see it's all banged up. Uh, and uh, it was, it's broken there? Yeah. Your, your right shoulder is broken? Sh shoulder and the scapula was busted. My leg, my foot, uh, the two bones broken on my foot. Uh, in your right foot? Right foot. You have that on a cast, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This year they're going to wait to see what happens, uh, operation, or they're going to try to do physical therapy. Okay. And I lost uh, my tooth. <laughs> are, are you talking about the shoulder then? Yeah, shoulder, physical therapy for the okay. shoulder. Okay, tell me something. How do you feel about uh, the incident, about the people who pulled this, who did this? Uh, well, I've been 29 years on job and I've seen everything already, so uh, I was there the first explosion, the first uh, thing that they should be. Uh, I really, I feel bad for them, you know, they have their own problems, they don't, why they explore it for, you know, explore it, you know, and that's all I can say about them, you know, keep it in their own problems, their own place, you know. While you were trying to escape, did you see anyone else who was injured by the <laughs> devastation? No, the last thing I knew is I was holding my co-worker hand, and that's when the building fell and we lost, you know, we went apart. I didn't hear, hear anybody else. I didn't see anything else. That was the last thing I knew. The last thing again, I heard somebody yell, help twice, while I was stuck under the staircase. I heard them bawl out, help twice, and I didn't hear anything again. Okay, do you know what happened to your coworker? No. You haven't seen your coworker since? No. <laughs> but she's still hopeful that they will be found. And Harry and Linda are in that area where everybody's still looking for them. Let's go back to them now. Harry, Linda? That's exactly right, John and Rosanna. You know, you've seen a lot of pictures of the World Trade Center, but uh, we are going to be showing you some pictures tonight that uh, we have just received. And these are pictures that you have not seen before and different views of the World Trade Center disaster as well. Actually, um, we showed them a little while ago, earlier today, and the reason that I'm mentioning that is because when people in the viewing audience saw the pictures, some people thought that they recognized some of the people in these pictures. Now, we don't know who took the pictures, but they are pictures that are taken uh, after the first plane crashed, but before uh, the collapse of the Twin Towers. Now, what these pictures show, you see the firefighters escorting people out, people being evacuated from the Twin Towers after the first plane crash. Uh, but again, look at these pictures very closely, because if you do happen to recognize anybody, we would like you to call the problem solver's number, because any information that you have about these folks could be helpful. Now, we don't know what happened to them. These folks could be home and safe with their families. We don't know, but that's why we're showing you these pictures in the event that you might know something about these people. The problem solver's number for you to call is one 877 Tell Fox 5. That number, once again, is 877-TELL-FOX-5. And, and folks, this is really important. If you happen to recognize anybody in any of those pictures, please give the number a call because any information that you have at all could be extremely helpful to the family and friends who are trying to possibly find some of the people in these, uh, in these photographs. Also, today we have some very interesting video for you. It's an inside look at the devastation. Now, this video was actually shot by a rescue worker. He was going through the Twin Towers, and obviously, looking at the video, uh, this is not the Twin Towers uh, that we are all used to seeing. Uh, walking through here today, uh, gnarled and twisted debris and just jagged pieces of metal here of uh, what remains of the uh, of the twin towers extremely dangerous you can see from the pieces of metal there how dangerous it would be for the rescue workers to work in all of this to dig through all of this stuff they're put in a pretty precarious situation and they're putting their lives on the line here folks we all know this every day going through all of this twisted debris harry the lot the, the pictures that we have seen that are, are extremely striking they're extremely dramatic dramatic but when you get up close when you actually go inside some of these buildings you see the force and the devastation and you also see some of the memories that people left behind let's take a look From the 22nd floor of Two World Financial Center, a frightening view through a blown out window looking down on piles of twisted metal, concrete, and heartache. From here, devastation as far as the eye can see. Now I'm actually leaning out the building right now, looking straight down at the wreckage site. 
Rob Matthews, a structural engineer with a passion for high-rise buildings, walked unchallenged past roadblocks around the collapsed trade towers. He shot this video because he says he wanted to capture this moment from his own perspective. I really took uh, this personally, taking down my towers, so I felt that I, I really wanted to, to see it myself. He walked past banks of computer screens and desks covered in dust, chairs, filing cabinets thrown clear, almost frozen in time, he says, as the workers fled. From here, a clear view of the damage to the neighboring number one World Financial Center, also called the American Express Building. It was hit by debris as one of the trade towers came crashing down. Across to 90 West, another office building, badly damaged by fire. Next door to that, the Bankers Trust High Rise, ripped open by a massive piece of debris. And the crisscross pattern of steel girders, which once supported the trade towers, now lying flat across a pile of rubble. And here's a fire truck, what's left of it. That's the front of it, the back of it. You know, the back got totally torn off, I guess, when part of the structure came down. For hours, Matthews wandered this site past the Millennium Hotel, Liberty Plaza. Authorities are concerned that both buildings may be in danger of collapse. Unbelievable. It's, it's hell on earth. Uh, it's an absolute war zone. It's, it's still hard for me to believe that, uh, that this could have happened. And from this view, high above, another grim reminder that this is a tragedy like never before. Some incredible uh, images of uh, just people, it seems like their life was just, uh, just frozen. And then for some, unfortunately, it was uh, snuffed out. You know, all that debris that they have been moving and moving and moving, some have estimated it's 400,000 tons, a half a million tons. It's unbelievable. it's unbelievable the amount of material that's going to have to be moved. And actually, our own Mary Garofalo has some uh, important information, some interesting information on exactly what they're doing with all of that debris. Mary? Well, Linda, we weren't at ground zero today, but we were at a place where they were moving ground zero, literally piece by piece. It's the absolute worst. It's just incredible, the things that are going. They're bringing the whole building up there. So it's just, you can imagine, twisted pieces of metal and everything else included. It's just horrible. It is here that the real investigation begins at the most heavily guarded dump site in the country, where truck after truck is cleared by armed officers and federal agents. The cargo they transport is what remains of the World Trade Center disaster. This driver already dropped off two truckloads today alone. Can you tell people what it looks like up there? How bad is it? You won't, you can't describe it. Why? It's so massive. For the past 72 hours, it has been a steady stream of trucks from lower Manhattan to Staten Island. Up this hill are more than 100 investigators who are sifting through some 6,000 tons of debris, separating them into three piles, airplane parts, building parts, and body parts. The priority right now is looking for body parts and the, um, what do you call it, the flight recorders. That seems to be it. Have they found them to the best of your knowledge? No. You have the FBI, you have um, the military, you have the fire department and the police department. So right now I think they're just trying to get it all together. It's covering acres and acres up there now, just spread out. But for some of these employees who are only used to seeing garbage dumped here, the contents of these trucks are more than they can take. Everybody's just in such a state of shock, you know, and just watching the trucks go in every day, I'm facing it, and it's just heartbreaking. Now, we weren't allowed onto the Staten Island dump site. No media is. But how, the most important components of this investigation will probably come from that dump site. But it'll take months for investigators to piece it together. That's it from the control room. Harry, Linda, back to you. Okay, Mary, thanks a lot for that report tonight. Now, down here in lower Manhattan, there are tens of thousands of people who remain homeless. In addition to the ones who are able to live in their homes, they don't have power. Well, Penny Crone's been dealing with some of these people today and uh, trying to help them out. Penny. Well, thanks, Linda. You know, most of us take it for granted right now we're watching television we're comfortable we have hot and cold water but if you look behind me there are tons of buildings back there and those apartments are all either empty or there are people actually living inside of them that have no electricity no water now if we pan to the left a little bit you're going to see this building here about four hours ago they, they got a generator the generator was able to bring the lights on but for the last three and a half days these people, who are mainly doctors and nurses, 
at New York Hospital and NYU Hospital have been living without any electricity. It's been very, very difficult. There are a lot of senior citizens down here. They need a lot of help, but a lot of them are getting it. There are thousands of people in the dark. Many have to walk hundreds of stairs just to get to their apartment. And when they get there, there's no water and electricity. When they're not home, some of these people are working to save lives. There are nurses and doctors at NYU hospitals. I live on 14th floor, and I have to walk 14th floor up in the darkness where I have to have a pen light in my hand and go 14 stairs up. And upstairs, we do not have any water. We can't have a cup of coffee. The air conditioners are not working, and we cannot sleep. When you go beyond the barricades and walk down towards where the World Trade Center once was, you see the National Guard. You see a lot of police officers. And you can also see thousands of vacant apartments. So many had to run from their homes, leaving their pets behind. That's one of the, uh, another, you know, tragic part of this um, entire tragedy that uh, pets have had to be left behind and um, there's not really much more we can say at this point because of those areas where the city, based on their knowledge, I think we all have to accept that they are the ones making decisions about this, the soundness of structures. It certainly hasn't been easy for these people. How are your uh, spirits? Well, they're perking up. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And now. you know what? I'm now minor perking up because of yes. you. Now, NYU Downtown Hospital has been having problems with their power. They do have power. Everything is fine. But they br just brought in this new truck here because some of the things, like the CAT scan, that kind of thing, they want to make sure that all the patients are safe and sound and secure. Also, I want to mention, we've all been talking about this, Patricia Wu. This is a firefighter, Joe Hunter. His family desperately wants to see him. Obviously, they're searching for him as they've been. And incidentally, a friend of mine, a New York City firefighter, just contacted me and said the New York City Fire Department, the searchers, have found four bodies of New York City firefighters, and they continue to work. In the same respect, one of the firefighters said, at least now the families will have comfort in knowing that. Reporting live with Harry and Linda, I will hand it back to you. Okay, Penny, thank you very much. Uh, one of the other problems, and certainly if you're looking for a loved one, this is a, by no means uh, in the same category, but there are many, many people who are just simply stranded in New York. They can't get out of here. They came here thinking that they were going to come for a nice vacation, a nice time, and suddenly they find themselves literally in the middle of a disaster, and they are tourists who are stranded here. Here's Chris Jones now. He has that part of the story. Well, Harry, the attack on the World Trade Center claimed thousands of lives, and of course, that's our first concern, but there are also fears it may have dealt a near-mortal blow to an already ailing airline industry. Take a look over here. This is how LaGuardia Airport looks right now. These uh, Port Authority police and paramilitary outfits, semi-automatic rifles, that's the real reality. That's the new reality of air travel in this country, and passengers are feeling it. New York area airports open for business today after being shut down for 18 hours on renewed security concerns. There had been no departures or arrivals at any of the three area airports since 6 p.m. Thursday. But it was hardly business as usual. In place of the familiar curbside check-in attendants, shotgun-toting Port Authority special police stood guard. And instead of packed concourses, there were nearly empty halls. Some flights were canceled and others that took off were only half full. There was still fear in the air, but not this mountain ski border. They switched me from this morning to this, this evening and now to tomorrow morning. Where are you going? I'm going to LAX. Uh, I got a competition in Santa Monica. What kind of competition? Uh, mountain boarding, the Panasonic Shockwave Core Tour. I was just competing in Jones Beach. So you don't scare easy? No, no. How about getting on a plane that's going to um, LAX, well, Los right, Angeles? Right now, I think this would be the safest time to fly uh -huh. with all the crackdown on security. While there were some takeoffs and landings, there were many more flights that were canceled. For some, that meant spending nights at nearby hotels and waiting. Is it frightening to you? Or are you afraid? Oh, yes. Uh, we are afraid. A little bit. Yeah, because uh, we can't imagine that it's real. You can't get back? No. And, I can uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law come up and they're picking me up from Rochester and I'm going home tomorrow. They're, they drove up to get me. They worried about you? Well, I'm just anxious to get home. Where are you from? 
the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Netherlands. Yeah. Did you ever expect something like this would happen in this country? No, it's, it's unbelievable that it happens. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's not, uh, I, I have no words for it. Well, that's exactly right. We don't have any words for it. And this is the new site in uh, American airports, not just here at LaGuardia, probably also at Kennedy Airport as well. And to give you some idea of the tension tonight, someone in Terminal C at Newark Airport, that's the Continental Terminal for those of you who are familiar with it, was waiting in line, apparently made some kind of offhanded remark. Someone took it to be a form of a threat and they evacuated the place. That was uh, on Flight 306 that was headed toward Detroit. Uh, they later found out that this, uh, this person was just making some kind of comment, was misinterpreted, and later they brought everybody back. But that gives you an idea of the tension. That gives you an idea of the problem for everyone. And uh, we're seeing Kennedy Airport right now. The Kennedy Airport is also going through the same, very same situation. So um, it's, it's a new world out there, a new frightened world for many would-be travelers in the air. And the hope is that the airline industry in this country will be able to survive it. I'm Chris Jones, Fox 5 News. Back to you, John Rosanna. All righty. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, the three major airports around here, as you said, reopened. They were closed for about 18 hours. They opened shortly after 11 this morning. Port Authority officials talked about uh, airport security and the status of our bridges and tunnels. Travelers should also allow as much time as possible to deal with the increased security. I will not discuss details of that security, but I promise you that it is intense. It will result in some delays, but I'm certain that most people will take the inconvenience of some of those delays for the increased sense of security as they travel. Bridges and tunnels, the George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, the Staten Island Bridges are all operating normally. The Holland Tunnel will remain closed for the time being until conditions are appropriate and we can work with the appropriate agencies to ensure that there will be free and smooth travel through the lower Manhattan region. And we'll let you know, of course, as soon as the Holland Tunnel opens. Now remember, more than ever, if you're heading to the airport, you call ahead and you check the status of your flight. Rosanna. All right, John. Well, Mike Gilliam's been keeping you updated with the very latest information, so get a pen ready. He's in the newsroom right now. Mike. Well, Rosanna, some good news for businesses uh, that have been shut down since the attack on the World Trade Center. The Giuliani administration is going to try to open up some of that area east of Broadway tomorrow. It's going to be kind of like a dry run. Now, the way they're going to do this is to ask business owners to come back into the area and try to see if they can get themselves ready to open up on Monday. Uh, there's going to be limited subway and bus service. The Fulton, Broadway, and Bowling Street stations will be open. The city's attempting to make arrangements for companies displaced by the attack to get office space in the area as well. The mayor says that there is space available. And for more information on that, what you need to do is call 1-800-I-LOVE-NEW-YORK. That's 1-800-I-LOVE-NEW-YORK. And the state's going to be on hand tomorrow with a walk-in location and people there to help you out. To reach them, you can call 1-800-456-8369. Now, the Port Authority had about 2,000 employees at the World Trade Center, and many of them are missing. But they're offering help uh, for their families at two crisis centers, which are going to be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. One of them is located at the Marriott at Newark Airport. The phone number is 973-642-0165. The other will be at the Ramada at JFK, and it can be reached at 718 751 8200. That's 718-751-8200. And families, friends, and colleagues can get information by calling 973-624-6203. Now, there's also help for others who are traumatized by these events. St. Vincent's Hospital has a mental health line, 212-604-8220. Uh, also, um, there's a number at Bellevue Hospital. The crisis line there is 212-562-562. 4877. Uh, for grief help in Queens, Jamaica Hospital, 718-206-7095. For Flushing Hospital, 718-670-5562. For Brookdale Hospital, 718-240-5761. And those facilities will be open from 10 to 4 tomorrow. There's also the Mental Health Association of Nassau County. Their number is 516-504-HELP. That's 516-504-HELP. Uh, and Maimonides uh, Medical Center Crisis Counseling Hotline is 718-283-8426. A couple of other notes for you. Families of students at PS89 in Battery Park City, they can get information by calling and leaving a message on 
4641. That hotline number is 917-302-4641. And one final note, uh, School Chancellor Harold Levy has announced plans for reopening schools. All schools above Canal Street will open at the regular time on Monday. And then there's a plan for the schools below Canal Street. To get that plan, it's very complicated, but to get to your school, you should go to their website at nycenet.edu. Okay, back to you in the studio. If you're planning on coming into the city tomorrow, you may want to know a little bit about the traffic situation. Kate Andrews is going to fill you in on that. Kate? All right, John, Rosanna, right now, as you travel out, police and fire departments are asking you to please stay out of the fire lanes as emergency vehicles are having difficulty traveling through. There's plenty of other lanes for you to get by around the city streets. That is citywide, so please stay out of the fire lanes. Also keep in mind that as the president is in town, you will expect frozen zones as you travel throughout the city also. Going into our first map, checking out how things are working with our subways, our trains, our buses. At this point, everything is running. It's pretty much on, a, on or close to schedule. Of course, everything is closed south of Canal Street. Keep that in mind. Detours are uh, expected with the trains, subways, ferries out of West 38th Street into Weehawken and Hoboken. Path is also running in and out of 33rd Street, and that will run out towards uh, from the New York and Hoboken, uh, Newark, excuse me, and Hoboken lines. Now, as we go also to the Gothels Bridge, that is still moving very heavily out of uh, New Jersey, heading right across the eastbound Staten Island Expressway and working your way out towards the Verrazano Bridge. Now, this has actually been very heavy throughout the afternoon. Keep that in mind for your weekend traveling as uh, pretty much Staten Island's been staying very heavy throughout. And also, the Gowanus has been backed up uh, both ways. Right now, it's still jammed up from Canal to the Brooklyn Bridge. But keep in mind, as you travel throughout Brooklyn and Queens, this is definitely the roadway to avoid. Now, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Holland Tunnel, of course, still remain closed. All your other crossings at this point are open. They're moving nicely right now. But again, for your weekend, things may actually get starting to, uh, will may be backed up on some of these bridges. So just allow yourself extra travel time. John and Rosanna, back okay. to you. Thanks, Kate. Well, some of the terrorists may have gone to a flight school in Florida and stayed at one particular motel. Now we're getting new information in right this second. Orlando Salinas has it. He's standing by in Miami right now. Orlando. Rosanna, John, good to see you all tonight. Let's take you inside room number 12 of the Deerfield Beach Hotel here. This place is called the Panther Motel Apartments. This is where authorities believe at least two of those 18 suspected terrorists stayed for a couple of weeks, actually stayed in this room, paid about $50 a night. Come on in, Chris, let's show these folks. Now, since Thursday, a good swarm of FBI agents, local police, have been going over every single thing in this place. Let's show you what we're talking about. You see this thin layer of black dust. This is really just powder. They have been looking for fingerprints on everything. They stacked everything here on these two queen-size beds inside this room, and they have been in here for a couple of days, a good 24 hours or so, looking for any kind of clues, any evidence. Now, the motel owner said one of the suspects, a man by the name of Marwan Al-Shahi, checked in on August 26th, checked out on September 9th, just a couple of days before the attacks took place in New York, D.C., and Pennsylvania. He said that when that man checked out, he got a little bit curious. He went outside in the dumpster, started looking through those guys' things that he threw out. He found a brand new backpack. Inside that backpack, he said he found a couple of flight manuals, also found a couple of books on karate. And he also said that those guys really, for the most part, were loners. He also said if he knew then what he knows now about those guys, he would have throttled them. Well, I don't know if they were experts or not, but they have the, uh, books on, on the martial arts. And I, in my private opinion, I think they use them in case, in case they would have a scenario like the one that plowed into the uh, field somewhere to defend themselves or kick away the, the people that would attack them or stop them. Investigators say Marwan Al-Shahi crashed that second plane into the tower of the World Trade Center. Also, Chris, if we could come over this way. Uh, here is something also very interesting. Now, the motel manager, the motel owner said when he came in, he found a cloth covering this picture here. He said that Marwan Al-Shahi felt that this picture was too revealing, that this woman in this picture was showing too much shoulder, too much legs, maybe too much skin. So he covered up this picture with a big old cloth. He also calls Marwan Al-Shahi a hypocrite because he said Marwan Al-Shahi covered that up, but he would go outside, hang up by the balcony, and look at the women in their bikinis. The search for the co-conspirators continues. We're live in Deerfield Beach, Florida. Orlando Salinas for Fox 5 News. Thank you, Orlando. 
Well, the Senate approved $40 billion in emergency aid. About half that money will help the victims of the terrorist attacks. The other half will fund anti-terrorism efforts. New York has two words to America. Thank you. You were there in our hour of need. You shone a little light in our great darkness. And we'll be back. And I particularly want to thank the president and the um, staff uh, of the White House, the OMB, uh, who understood our request when Chuck and I were in the Oval Office yesterday and asked uh, the president for an additional $20 billion. Uh, he immediately agreed. Uh, and it meant a great deal to us and to the people of New York. Uh, so we're, um, we're very grateful today. The bill passed by the Senate also gives President Bush the authority to use necessary and appropriate force against those responsible for the attacks. John. Well, we're going to need every, every penny of that money. It's going to cost billions to rebuild lower Manhattan alone. The government, as you just heard, is helping out. But what about the businesses that just had to shut down? Who's going to cover their losses? Stephanie Shelton reports. The enormity of what has happened is only just beginning to sink in, in human tragedy, in permanently lost jobs and businesses, and of course, in property losses. It seems certain that this will be the largest insured disaster in the history of insurance in the United States. Estimates range as high as $25 billion, but with payouts spread across many major companies, insurance officials say the industry can withstand the financial onslaught. We don't think this will put insurance companies under, but it will be, a, uh, it'll be strongly felt. Um, strongly enough felt that they'll start raising insurance premiums for all the rest of us now? Well, in any uh, catastrophe, following that, uh, the reserves from which the claims are paid have to be replenished. And there's only one source of that money. And that is from higher insurance premiums, something many people, especially those with small businesses, may not be able to afford. It was closed for about two days. There was nothing open uh, around Empire State. They told us to close the stores and basically go home. Danny Zambrisky's souvenir store, New York Skyline, is across the street from and dependent upon the Empire State Building. But he, like so many other similar small shops and businesses, doesn't have business interruption insurance, which can be quite expensive. I never really considered that. I mean, this just never really crossed my mind that something like that would happen. Right. Do you have it? I get, like, like many a small business, I'm sure we're underinsured. And so it's like, I mean, I don't really read the product print, but I seriously doubt my business interruption insurance is going to cover this. This is $10,000 in lost comic book sales at Jim Hanley's Universe for just the past two days. Money that can't be made up. We're a marginal business. You know, we've, uh, you know, we've, you know, we've been doing this for 15 years, and uh, you know, we've had our share of financial difficulty. So, uh, you know, skating on the edge is... You know, been almost a constant companion. Insurance industry officials say it's just too soon to know how the money will be paid out or to whom, because no one has yet had time to add up the true damages. At the Empire State Building, Stephanie Shelton, Fox 5 News. Wall Street will reopen on Monday, along with hundreds of businesses in Lower Manhattan, as we just said. They have been closed since the attack on America. Everyone's wondering what phone service will be like. A spokesman for, Ver for Verizon says their equipment took a pretty big hit, but crews are working around the clock to get things back online by Sunday night. We're going to work like crazy to get done what we need to get done by Monday morning, uh, probably more like Sunday night, to make sure that we can support the city and the industry. Uh, as well as all the residential and commercial folks in that area. Now, I'm not naive enough to believe that this is going to be a perfect situation, but the fact is it's going to be damn good. Verizon says it could take months to repair all that damage. All right, back to uh, Harry Linden now at Ground Zero. Well, we've been calculating the losses. You talked about the insurance losses uh, before. Uh, one of the things that they lost in this uh, huge disaster is a lot of ones and zeros. You put the ones and zeros together and you come up with a huge database. The huge database is uh, the high-tech part about what was lost. And that's right, and right now we have a special report for you from Claudia Cohen regarding that loss. Amid the devastation, amid the loss of life and expertise, critical information stored in computers and on paper, gone. From financial accounts to customer orders, wire transactions, and email, recovering such data could literally determine a company's survival. You can replace your software, you can play, replace your hardware, 
Uh, tragically, you can't replace your people. And sadly, you can't replace your data unless it's backed up. The immediate disaster is loss of life, and what are we going to do? And as soon as that does uh, recede a little bit, whenever that might be, then it's going to be, so how do I carry on with my life? While rescue crews dig for signs of life, high-tech recovery firms will be conducting their own excavations, searching for signs data was saved and stored somewhere off-site. Comdesco is helping six Twin Tower customers get back online, including the New York Board of Trade, which hopes to restore commodity trading by Monday's opening bell. Most financial companies, including hard-hit Morgan Stanley, stored backup records out of state. But letters, memos, and paper receipts, even legal documents, are another matter. Without a copy, those records could be impossible to replace. And I think there are going to be many stories of companies that were located in, in the Twin Towers and the surrounding buildings that weren't able to go back into business when they finally, you know, rebuilt their, their companies. They may find that they're, they're out of business because they've lost their data. Industry experts say that after sustaining, for example, flood or earthquake damage, many companies without data recovery systems in place go out of business within five years. In an economy so reliant on digital data, secure information may be one key to recovery. In San Francisco, Claudia Cowan, Fox News. Of course, one of the things that New York is known for uh, worldwide, that's its fine restaurants, its excellent service. Uh, the people that run those restaurants and the people who uh, have the service in those restaurants are also pitching in in this crisis. Here's Kimberly Richardson. Many of these people have not had a chance to get back. But civilians, too. We believe that the biggest thieves in the world are Americans, and the biggest terrorists on earth are the Americans. The only way for us to fend off these assaults is by using similar means. We do not differentiate between those dressed in military uniforms and civilians. They're all targets in this fatwa. Six weeks later, simultaneous truck bomb explosions leveled two U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. 225 people were killed. FBI officials believe bin Laden was also behind a plan to set off a huge bomb during the Millennium Celebration in the Los Angeles International Airport. The man allegedly carrying the explosives was captured at the Canadian border. He has now allegedly admitted to being trained in bin Laden's camps. After the bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen last fall, both Yemeni and American officials said all of the suspected bombers in custody had trained in bin Laden's camps in Afghanistan. Bin Laden later released a video celebrating the attack, which killed 17 U.S. sailors. And just three weeks before the attacks that leveled the World Trade Center and part of the Pentagon, Bin Laden released another video promising another attack on America. John Miller, ABC News, New York. The focus for many now is what we can do to get bin Laden and how we can prevent future acts of terror. And for some insight on that, on that we're now joined by retired General Chuck Horner, who joins us from Pensacola, Florida. He ran the air.